Cindy, I am really excited about these new products we just partnered with. You mean the Via Hemp products? Mm -hmm. Me too. I'm excited because now our listeners can get these amazing gummies at a discounted rate. That's right. I mean, right now, my favorite is the Via Flow State CBG and CBD gummies because we know that you guys are busy like us. For me, it's really hard to stay on track and get everything done in one day. My to-do list is like 20 pages long. 20 pages long. The Via Flow State gummies really help me focus and they help me concentrate and I can get through my to-do list without freaking out. Yeah, I was looking for something to help me unwind when I started taking the Zen gummies and they totally made me Zen. So Zen, I was like, who are you? (laughs) It turns off the stress and I was able to sleep through the night for the first time in a very long time. You know what I really love about them is that Via Hemp products are organic. I'm all about organic. Yes, you are. And they're trusted by over 250,000 customers. And they have products for everyone. So if you don't want THC, they have THC free. It's up to you. It all depends on the dosage. Exactly. From zero to 100 milligrams, you can choose on their website. And they have really great flavors. Strawberry, blueberry, grapefruit. I mean, there's a ton of flavors. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. And at the end of the day, when it's time to chill, I love the Delta 9 CBN Dreams because it takes the edge off. And I love how relaxed I feel. I really like the High Love Gummies. It's an organic aphrodisiac. It just makes you feel really warm and relaxed. And I tell all my friends, they need to try it. And the best part is Via legally ships to all 50 states in discreet packaging to your door with a worry-free guarantee, no medical card required. So for people 21 and over, you can get 15% off and a free pack of these award-winning gummies with our exclusive code PITC at ViaHemp.com. That's V-I-I-A-H-E-M-P.com. That's V-I-I-A, hemp.com. Use P-I-T-C at checkout. Please support the show and tell them we sent you. Enhance your everyday with Via Hemp. A note to listeners. The following podcast contains content that may not be suitable for all audiences. Almost in one meeting, he spilled out something like 25 Wow. Um, and, and we didn't know who the hell they were. That was my job. I was kind of like the intelligence analyst. Um, Jennifer would get these things out of him. I would make sense of it. And, and so we closed uh, nine cases. We assisted Bergen County on three, Kelly and Pryor. You know, the feeling of the empathy, it's always the question of, is it real? Is it not? And it seems like you've already asked the question of, is he really feeling this? And he said, no, but he wants to feel it. Yeah, he's got no compunction, Cottingham, um, admitting that it doesn't feel anything. And and um, I, I, I mean, his, he's an outlier as far as serial killers go, because there's nothing in his childhood history, at least that he's admitted to me, Her classmates, some boys, had attempted to gang rape her and that she was killed in that attempt. And, and, and the witnesses saw her talking about 10 minutes, 20 minutes before her murder, talking with these boys. And, and so now they're in their 60s and 70s because the murder was in 1968. And people in this town are still pointing at these old guys and saying they're they're the guys who tried to rape Jackie Hart and killed her, right? And they don't know that the case was closed. That it was a serial killer. You are listening to Partners in True Crime. We are your hosts, Rob and Cindy Dorfman. Hi, everyone. If you're enjoying the podcast, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcasts, even if it's one word. And please subscribe to our website, www.partnersintruecrime. Follow us on TikTok, Facebook, and Instagram to check out our weekly promos. We're also now on YouTube at Partners in True Crime. If you subscribe to our website, you'll be getting weekly emails from us and all kinds of promotions and things that we don't advertise on the podcast. Richard Cottingham was known as the Torso Killer in the Times Square Ripper. He was convicted in New York of six murders committed between 1972 and 1980, and convicted in New Jersey of 12 murders committed between 1967 and 1978. Cottingham is believed to have committed at least 80 murders in the United States. 
Today, we are back talking with Peter Vronsky, a Canadian author, filmmaker, and a forensic historian. He holds a PhD in criminal justice, history, and espionage. He, along with Jennifer Weiss, the daughter of Cottingham's later victims, were able to extract more confessions from Cottingham about his murders. The work that both Laura and Peter do is so important for the victims' families, because without resolution, there can be no peace of mind. So now it's time for part two of Peter's interview. I remember when I met Laura, and she was way ahead of me. I mean, she was much more experienced than I was. Um, I, I think the difference between Laura and, 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 and me at that moment was that I had written more books. Uh, but those the books I had written really weren't anything like the kind of work Laura was doing. I mean, she was talking to these guys. I was just starting out with one guy, uh, you know, because of Jennifer. So... So, so I, I, I remember our conversation. Laura was asking me a lot of questions about, you know, how to publish a book, what it's like being a writer and, and things. So I was more of a writer um, than really an experienced um, investigator in serial homicide. Laura had all that experience. Uh, though that was not her first trip into prison and interviewing uh, people, but I, I was pretty wet behind the ears. So I remember we had an interesting um, conversation at that time. I bet. Yeah. So Peter, Peter, can you tell us a little bit about the extractions that you did get and the other cases that you were able to solve by talking to Cottingham? Because, I mean, that's a lot of cases that yeah. you were able yes. to solve. Yeah. Like, in what point did he, did it, period of time, did he start uncorking all that information? Was it, he was it? He started uncorking seriously. Almost in one meeting, he spilled out something like 25. Um, wow. And, and we didn't know who the hell they were. That was my job. I was kind of like the intelligence analyst. Um, Jennifer would get these things out of him. I would make sense of it. And, and so we closed uh, nine cases. We assisted Bergen County on three, Kelly and Pryor. Um, and, and the last one, um, oh, my God, uh, uh, De La Sala. Uh, which which Rob Angelotti kind of announced on his TV show in Nassau County, Long Island. Um, I identified a victim that he described to me, and oh my God, um, when I when I tracked her down, I realized that Nassau County PD had another suspect in that case that about five years earlier, they cleared using DNA. They had the perpetrator DNA for crying out loud, okay? So I rang to them, I said, you guys, this is Cottingham, you guys gotta run Cottingham's DNA. And believe, you know, amazingly, Cottingham's DNA was still not in CODIS accessible to New York. New Jersey had it, you know? CODIS is not as easy as we think. No, no, it's not. You can't go fishing in CODIS. So um, this became the oldest cold case closed in um, American history. A murder from 1968, Diane Cusick, who, um, when they went back and checked the, the DNA that they had extracted, they, they exhumed her and they managed to still extract the perpetrator DNA. And so uh, it matched to Cottingham once they once they got a chance now to run it, and 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 so based on that, um, he was going to be charged and extradited, and of course out of that deal came another four confessions, uh, and and three uh, were on my list. The, the fourth one surprised me. It was one that the uh, that I kind of had on my list, but I didn't think it was him. And, and I had furnished Nassau County with the ones that I thought were like 80% for sure, not to muddy the waters up, right? And, and this one I didn't put on the list, they came back and it was this one. So five cases, December 5th, 22, he uh, pleads to one. The other four are exceptional closures, including Diane Cusick he pled to. Um, and a few months prior to that, Jennifer and I closed the case in Rockland County, New York, um, with the granddaughter of the victim as well assisting us. Wow. Right? 
Uh, wow. So this was Lorraine uh, McGraw, which um, caught, which I also I found in a way that was my first case. Um, and, and I found it in the sense that Cottingham's memory, he, you see, he never planned any of his murders. He's an impulse driven serial killer. He doesn't fantasize, he doesn't dream, he doesn't keep clippings. Um, and, and, and so because he didn't fantasize about doing these things, he doesn't remember when he actually was or where he was when he saw a victim that, that he would then, on opportunity, uh, abduct and murder. And, and, and so very difficult, you know, with, with this case, he had a vague memory. Yeah, um, I left a girl off 9W, somewhere near Nyack. So, um, you know, newspapers.com is, is one of the most valuable investigative tools. You know, I start looking. Uh, I spend half my day on that off thing. Nine w <laughs> that are going to match his signature, his profile. Right, sure mm -hmm. enough, um, I find Lorraine McGraw, uh, March 1st, 1970. Uh, we reach out to her family, through her family. She reaches back to us, the granddaughter. And, and, and so Jennifer and I kind of mobilize the granddaughter as well to write to Cottingham and, and give him a sense of, uh, he doesn't feel remorse, but he has cognitive remorse. He understands um, what remorse entails, but he admits he doesn't feel it. But but he wants to, he wants to, and 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 so he has this kind of intellectual appreciation of the gravity of his acts that he didn't have when he was a younger man, um, and and um, he he tries to behave and 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 do things that somebody with remorse would do but he doesn't feel it he, he he just says you know i i don't feel it but i know what the right thing to do is and 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 so um that's how he connected with jennifer yeah. that's how you know and a lot of the confessions he kind of did for for you know for jennifer i killed your mom uh, Jennifer, um, of course, had ambitions to be on TV. She wanted to do a, a TV show doing what she was doing. And, and, and Cottingham, you know, at one point, how this all started was Cottingham made a comment to me. He said, maybe I should confess to one to make Jennifer more famous on TV. All right. Uh, and and I, I just jumped in like a parasite, like a tick, like, like a vampire uh, on Cottingham. Uh, and, and I said, yeah, you know, uh, maybe you should confess to Ted, then you'll really make Jennifer famous. Uh, and that got the wheels turning. And so then I went back to the cops and I told, I said to the cops, listen, if you let a TV crew come in and film Cottingham with Jennifer around confession time, he's going to give you some confessions. Right. So, so some of the cops were just like a gas, you know, we don't do TV. Right. Uh, other cops, uh, you know, I remember one cop saying, you know, I don't care if she's sitting on his lap uh, as long as the confessions are um, righteous, genuine confessions, we'll, we'll do it. So so that's how it kind of began as almost like to make Jennifer famous on TV, essentially. And, and the only problem was, um, you know, the litmus test, of course, is with cops is. Is, and, and their district attorneys, is is he going to tell us something that wasn't in the papers that we held back in the files? And of course, these, these murders going back to the 60s, nobody held anything back, right? Everything was in the papers. So it's a tough, tough call. Uh, and, and, and so I had to kind of rebuild his memory and, and take him through those places, find out where exactly those murders were and take them through those places without planting any additional memories in his head. He had to recall things on, on, on his own. And, and so there would be like little details, uh, you know, where the victims, he often used the victim's car. Uh, you know, where were the keys to the car when you were finished? 
So he would remember little things like that. And, and so cops were able to look at the files, the ones that survived. Uh, there's a lot of files. Um, uh, one of the most frustrating things is, is the police come back to you and said, there was a flood. You know, it, it seems to me like every single police archive had a flood at some or point. Or a fire, uh, a fire, a flood. I've heard it all. And then yeah. miraculously, yeah. it was a fire. It yeah. it was, the mice ate it. Uh, uh, Laura, really quickly, I saw you nodding your head when he was talking about Cottingham's um, MO and the way that he uh, knew that he had to show empathy even though he didn't feel it. Can you talk about yeah. that a little bit? What is that a symptom of? And that is pretty common amongst these serial killers. You know, the feeling of the empathy, it's always the question of, is it real? Is it not? And it seems like you've already asked the question of, is he really feeling this? And he said, no, but he wants to feel it. He's got no compunction, Cottingham, um, admitting that it doesn't feel anything. And and um, I, I, I mean, his, he's an outlier as far as serial killers go, because there's nothing in his childhood history, at least that he's admitted to me, that is anything similar to other serial killers other than one thing, a severe head injury when he was four years old. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that's what I think it is, because Peter, was that everything that else about well? him, you know, he's got this 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 cohesive childhood, and and unless he's hiding something, and I kind of joke about it with him because he was a choir boy in a Catholic church, you know, and and and, and so the joke with with me and Cod- between Cottingham and myself is is uh, you know, Rich, you better tell me something because I'm just going to write that you were raped as a choir boy in the church, right? Mm. Uh, and, 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 you know, because you got to give me something. There's a blank page. Mm-hmm. And he's got nothing. He's got nothing. He's got nothing other than, than this one head injury that I documented that was serious enough to be reported in the newspapers. Um, and, and we know, like from, from um, you know, Keel's work on psychopathy, that, that probably what Cottingham has is trauma-induced psychopathy to the frontal lobe. He, he uh, ran into a moving car, hit him in the in the frontal lobe, right? Same as NFL player injuries, right? Same as boxing injuries that a lot of guys would take a, a shot to the head, right? And 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 so he's he his symptoms essentially mimic psychopathy. He's got a need for excitement. He um we you know live these secret lives he's got no empathy um no remorse um none of it he, he is just like a shark um yeah you know driven by appetite um, and, and that's he was why I call him a, a werewolf essentially he, he, he's like yeah. Ron Chaney, um and, and except every night is, was a full moon for this guy but, but he didn't plan anything. He didn't set out, I'm going to get a girl. He didn't really troll for a particular victim. He trolled for opportunities. And that's why I think he doesn't remember them. You know, and, you know, there's no newspaper clippings. Um, the, the, you know, the stuff that newspapers reported about him having souvenirs, um, that, was, you know, that was evidence that he didn't, recent evidence that he didn't have time to get rid of. Right. Um, they, 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 the, the, you know, the big thing was, was, for example, one of the things that we found in his M.O. was was all and we didn't know whether this is M.O. or signature. A lot of the victims were missing their shoes. Like, where the <laughs> hell are the shoes? Why are the victims without shoes? Right? Cottingham victims. And, 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 and so, the, you know, the first thing that enters your head, this guy is, you know, a Jerry Brutus. He's got some kind of fixation with shoes, with their feet. What is it, right? And 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 of course, when they do the search warrant on this house, they don't find any collection of shoes. So so what the hell, right? So finally, when I got to him, very simple explanation. Uh, he would force the women to take their shoes off because he didn't want to get kicked by, by you know by shoes. So so right away, okay, this is mo now. Uh, practical, but, practical. But that's how I found some of the victims. I started, I hit the newspapers and I started putting in keywords, shoes missing, 
a woman slain, shoes missing. And sure enough, two or three cases that were his came out from those key words. They were missing their shoes. Wow. It's crazy. Wow. Yeah. Well, Lord, he, he answered yeah. your frontal lobe question. So, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> I mean, that could be, it could be that, it could be DNA. And exactly. Peter, was he, um, was he, he was married with children during the crimes, correct? Yes. Yeah. He, he was married 10 years. He had three children. Uh, he had um, three mistresses at the same time in New York. Um, wow. That's and, a lot and, of work. And, and one mistress yeah. knew about the other uh and knew about the wife the other mistress knew about the wife but not the other mistress um and and then he had a, a, a third girl that he was running kind of as a hobby as a sex worker um who ran away from him and 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 she was found in 2004 for the longest time everybody was convinced that he had killed her but in fact she you know she hadn't and she was 2004, they find her. She's still using the same pseudonym he had given her um, for scams. There were, she and he were out uh, stealing women's wallets in, in bars, and then they would take the credit card and use up the credit card up to a $500 uh, amount, right? And so she was working with him, these credit card scams. And, and police... Um, Actually, Cottingham's wife, in the last six months, she really started suspecting him of stuff. And she had started divorce proceedings in the last year, which he kind of says that was the reason for his meltdown, because he got very sloppy at the end of his career, almost like Bundy. The way Bundy goes, you know, lurching mm -hmm. back and forth in Florida. Um, he's no longer the same Ted Bundy. He's disintegrating. Cottingham is disintegrating those you know, those, those torsos, uh, you know, yeah. he, he was, he got arrested uh, at random because he brought back a girl to the same hotel where he murdered another girl 10 days earlier, right? And, wow. and he rescued her. She ended up being a witness against him. So Cottingham was in a meltdown, but um, he indeed, he, he would work the late shift from about four to midnight um, his mistresses were nurses. So he would go for the first two hours, he'd see mistress one. Then the next two hours, he'd see mistress two. Um, and he would always want to be home before um, uh, uh, dawn to so the neighbors don't see that he's away all night. And, and he wants to be there to have breakfast with his kids and see his kids off to school. And then he puts in a few hours of sleep. Skeptical about custom beauty? I get it. My feed is flooded with customize this, personalize that. Everybody's promising to fix my split ends, uh -oh. my dry skin, and my fine lines. And you know that all these products I buy, none of them have worked. Lots of products she buys. <laughs> but now I'm so excited because I get to share this with you guys. We have partnered with pros. And when they say custom, they actually mean it. It's not a gimmick. Your formula does not exist without you. And each and every bottle of Prosed custom hair and skin care is made to order, personalized with a unique blend of naturally powerful and proven effective ingredients to meet your needs. They have this in-depth consultation that analyzes 80 factors for a complete view of you, your life, and your beauty goals. Wow, that's a lot. And they get personal. Pros gets to the root of the problem. They cover everything from your diet, concerns, to exercise and stress, to uncover what's impacting your hair and skin health. I love the fact that they even asked me for my zip code to assess the hard water, because that's a terrible problem in my neighborhood. <sighs> and how, oh my God, Hard water, right? we have really bad hard water. Really bad. So, and then they also tell you how this impacts my hair and my skin. And then they recommend an entire routine of truly personalized products that were not created until after I placed my order. So there's nothing pre-mixed, nothing off the shelf. And I know this from experience that their one-of-a-kind formulas equal one in a million results. Since I switched to pros, my hair is shinier, stronger, fuller, and my skin is not dry. And I live in the desert. And everyone is noticing. Yep, I noticed. You look fantastic. Thank I you. can definitely see how Cindy's hair has grown so much since she has been using pros. But don't just take our word for it. In a third-party, double-blind, dermatologist-supervised 
randomized controlled clinical study, the gold standard in research studies pros proved personalized works better than off-the-shelf alternatives. Try it for yourself and get the healthiest hair in 30 days or your money back. Pros is so confident that you'll love the results that they're offering our listeners an exclusive trial offer so you can see the difference custom care can make. You got to try it. 50% off your first subscription order at pros.com slash P-I-T-C. That's pros.com slash P-I-T-C for your free consultation and 50% off your one-of-a-kind formula. Pros.com slash P-I-T-C. Wow. Uh, so did you ever talk to his? Did you ever talk to his family members, his kids, his ex-wife? Um, I don't, partly because um, I, I I kind of swore an oath with Cottingham that I wouldn't touch his family. His family's taboo, all right. Um, and and I know that you know the kids won't have anything to say. I mean, when they're kids, what do they know? All right? what? So so um, the wife. Uh, she slams the door when police come to see her. The police really want to talk to her, right? Because now they got questions for her. They found out so much about Cottingham since 1980 that, that she may enlighten them on, right? And she essentially shuts the door in this space. Um, so she, 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 she's still using his name. She's still under, you know, his name. Uh, she she has divorced him, but um, you know, and the divorce too. A lot of mythology about the divorce. Basically, she was divorcing him uh, for mental cruelty that that he stopped having sex with her and he wasn't coming home anymore. Uh, but, uh, there's no accusations of of um, you know physical abuse or anything like that. And 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 oddly enough too. Uh, um, the, the, the mistresses as well, they, they defended him to the bitter end. They, they couldn't believe it that Richie, um, their, their generous, um, sensitive, um, you, you, you know, good humored, nice guy, was a serial killer or a killer was inconceivable to the two of them. And, and, and I, I read. I, I went through their statements to the police. I read the, you know, the, the interviews, and they're very hostile. They're really defending um, Cottingham, and, and 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 of course, you know, just watching him with Jennifer. Um, though, though, you know, he 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 misses. I mean, he grieves. He's got feelings. I, I know he doesn't have remorse, but he certainly has grief, and he grieves for. For for Jennifer, um, you Peter, know, did, he, did he connect that way with any of the other victims' family members, like he did with Jennifer? <laughs> did he connect with any of the other victims' family members the way he did with Jennifer? Um, yes, uh, I connected with a lot of family members of of of, of his. Um, yeah. Um, oh no, I, I mean I, Cunningham. Did he did he connect with any of his oh, other? Yes, victims he did. Yes, yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, since Jennifer. Yes, um, and and definitely, um, I recruit some that are a frame of mind to do this. Um, not all family victims are ready to talk uh, to a murderer, you know, of their family member. Some are, some are, right? Um, most are, in fact. Um, yeah, and, and of course, the, the process of forgiveness is, is 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 you know, Jennifer forgave him. Um, and a number of family members have formally forgiven them. So, so that encourages his confession in a way too, because, um, you know, when Jennifer forgave him, it was um, a moment for him, you know, because the last confession he had done was in 2010. And in fact, that was his first confession. The first five murders when he was on trial between 1980 and 1984, he pled not guilty and I didn't do it. I was framed. Okay. So he never confessed until 2010 when he confesses to Nancy Vogel, October, 1967, he murdered her in New Jersey. And, and, and so that comes now, you know, 30 years after, mm -hmm. you know, he's put away. So, that was his first confession, and it went very badly. The judge just called him a monster, 
um, the the um, one of the uh, the son of Nancy Vogel, Bill Vogel, of course, made a victim impact statement, and 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 he tore into Cottingham, and none of that was supposed to happen. You see, um, the Vogel confession that took nearly eight years to to actually negotiate. Um, and it was begun long before our chief Anzalotti got on it. Um, and, and so it, there, it was supposed to be done quietly. The press was not supposed to be there. Somebody leaked it. Um, it was on the court calendar, but they put it in August when nobody is there. Right. But somebody leaked it. The press showed up. Uh, now the judge has the press watching, so it wasn't going to be a discreet confession. And and Cottingham, as he's getting um, humiliated and 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 just um, berated in court, turns to Ancelotti and 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 says, you know, I'm never doing this again. And and so the next three confessions were in secret. You see. By the time I arrived in 2018 to talk with him, um, there were already three confessions done in secret that nobody knew except the families. And, 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 and so Cottingham kind of hints to me that he's already made three more, he didn't say three, that he's already made more confessions. And I eventually tap in through an attorney into the victim network and, and confirmed that he had, in fact, confessed to three. Uh, and the victim family are, are getting upset because the earliest one was 2014. And, and they can't talk about it. And a lot of the victim family members are complaining to me. They're saying, you know, we feel like we're almost complicit in the murder because we can't talk about it. Why can't we talk about that the murder has been solved? Right? Mm-hmm. And, 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 and there was this town in in uh, Bergen County, Midland Park, where he murdered a girl uh, coming home from band practice at school. And it was assumed that her classmates, some boys, had attempted to gang rape her and that she was killed in that attempt. And, and, and the witnesses saw her talking about 10 minutes 20 minutes before her murder, talking with these boys. And and so now they're in their 60s and 70s because the murder was in 1968. And people in this town are still pointing at these old guys and saying they're, they're the guys who tried to rape Jackie Harp and killed her, right? And they don't know that the case was closed, that it was wow. a serial killer. In fact, when those boys were talking to Jackie Harp, they were talking to her in front of a root beer place, Stewart's Root Beer. Mm-hmm. He was inside. He stopped to get a root beer, and he saw her talking to the boys, and he followed her in his car and killed wow. her. Oh, my God. He didn't even know he was in Midland Park. He wow. had no idea. I had no idea where I was. Right? So he just did it, like, like spontaneous. It was just like... Yes. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's terrifying. Exactly. Okay, that's terrifying right there. Exactly. Why? Like a werewolf. Right. Yeah, like an animal. Like an animal. Like that, like that an animal. reptilian gene that you were talking about in your book. It's that <laughs> and reptilian moment, gene. That- yeah, yeah, yeah. The kind of killer instinct that's 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 miswired. And, and how and old was that little girl? That head on the hit. That, that hit on the head, uh, you know, is what threw the wires off. So he, within 15 minutes, she was dead. Wow. How old was she? She was, uh, she was 13. Oh. And, and, and now, you know, she looked older. She looked, she, she, she looked much older. He thought he was killing like a 16, 17 year old uh, girl, but, but. Um, That's horrible. Uh, and he um, pounced on her. And and she she fought back. Um, there were too many houses around there, and and so she had a. Um, that's the other thing is is because she was in a marching band, she was the flag carrier, so she had this leather strap, 
where she would carry the flag and 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 she was very proud that she was like the bearer of stars and stripes in the marching band so when she was walking home she was carrying the flag carrier and one of the boys took the flag carrier and was playing around with it that's what she was strangled with so 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 um, those boys were suspects for all those years the case was closed like 2017 but they don't know it and and so i had a case where another case like that where jennifer and i arranged for a victim's sister because she could not believe that uh bergen county told her that cardingham had confessed to the murder of her sister she didn't believe bergen county and so she wanted to hear this from cardingham and so jennifer and i arranged for her to correspond with cardingham she did Cottingham persuaded her that he was with her sister that night. And 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 just from talking with her before and after, I could feel the sense of relief she had to realize that indeed uh, she's not being bullshitted by the police, by Bergen County, because she, you know, her murder was in 1969. And so she's been fighting Bergen County a uh, generations of prosecutors and, and police officers at Bergen County. She herself went to work with the Colorado Police Department and, and she for the for 40 years she was nagging Bergen County. They have a whole box of her faxes and letters and emails and, and so when they closed the case and then told her you can't talk about it to anybody, she was going nuts. So we arranged for her to talk directly to Cottingham and 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 she was so relieved that that Cottingham persuaded her that indeed he had killed her sister. And again, um, you know, Cottingham is still a practicing Catholic, and so is she. So she gave him benediction That's... and forgiveness as well, very formal forgiveness. And and wow. talking to her afterwards, um, I could sense just this light lightness in her. And then she dies. Uh. Yeah, but 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 you know when she died within like four or five months of that, I wow. thought, oh my God, you know another four. Or five, if I waited another four or five months, she would have died in that no. state she was before. Mm. And so that made me make that public announcement in Midland Park that I made, right? Because now, I heard from. Uh, you know, I put posts up on Facebook and so forth. And there's a minister who who hosts Jackie's friends in the marching band, the Imperial Knights. These old ladies, it's an all-girl marching band. So these old ladies still get together once a year wow. and update each other. Is there any news on Jackie's murder? Wow. So he says, why don't you come and talk to them? They're going to be meeting end of December, just before New Year's Eve, they're gonna be meeting in the church basement. Why don't you come? So so I came down and, and I broke the story essentially. And um, I talked to Rob about it. I talked to Burton County that I was gonna do this. Um, and, and they agreed on what I'll say, what I won't say. We went over the text. Um, over what's what you know what it, what what I was going to do, so I had their cooperation. Uh, the press was not invited, but they were prepared that eventually the press is going to find out. So I knew, um, you know, what, what that I can safely tell any press inquiries. You can call Bergen County, and they were they they essentially were agreed that Bergen County will confirm the name of the victim, date of death, cause of death, and who the perpetrator is, Richard Cottingham. And they won't say anything more. Uh, and that's how it happened. So, wow. Well, I was this, a I think shocked it's... when I saw Rob's documentary, you know, The Torso Killer Confessions, and, and he describes this episode, that the meeting in, in uh, he says it was in a public library, but it wasn't, it was in a church, right? And, and he makes it sound like, Oh my God, I woke up and there was Peter Vronsky on TV announcing it for crying out loud. Uh, we, we start, six months ago, I, I had the text approved because it was going to go into the second edition of Serial Killers already. I was going to make the announcement public. But, but that's the reason. I couldn't look at these old men who all their lives are having fingers pointed at them. You know, you killed Jackie Harp. 
um, and, 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 and they're dying too. You yeah. Know, um, a lot Is of that what got you in trouble with families have passed away? These are 50 year old cases, 68, yeah. 69. Um, and, and, and they could have been solved. The Vogel case. I mean, the Vogel case could have been solved in 1998. Governor Chris Whitten um, shut the deal down. There was a deal made already for the confession. Rob was still in short pants. Um, Alan Grieco made the deal, who was one of the original investigators. Um, but the governor at that moment, um, she had problems with looking to um, soft on crime. And, and so when she saw what Cottingham wanted, which was food, essentially, you know, he'll confess for food. You know, bring me some decent food and I'll, I'll talk to you, all right? So um, the deal was made and he would have confessed to Nancy Vogel in 98. And Nancy Vogel's mom was still alive. She mm. would have known what happened. Well, that's the thing. That's why this work that you're doing and Laura's doing is so important because these victims' families wait 50 years, 60 yeah. years, they're still waiting for answers. They don't give up. That's what people don't understand. When you lose a loved one in a murder where you don't know any of the answers, you don't know who killed them, you, you're going to keep fighting to find out what happened to them. I mean, you don't just give up. So what you guys are doing is so important. The work that you both are doing, it's amazing work. I'm glad that you both met each other. And I'm glad, Peter, that you were able to talk to us today because it's another insight into the work that Laura does, you know, mm -hmm. from some totally random, the universe just pulled you into this case and made you do this. <laughs> like totally let random. Me plug, let me plug one thing. Yes. Um, I'm now working with the National Institute for Law and Justice. Okay, it's it's a a, a nonprofit charity, uh, NLIJ. dot org, founded by ex NYPD police officers, and people who feel that they family member is not getting a proper investigation, they can petition us, and we'll undertake the investigation essentially uh, for not essentially for free the investigation will be done um they're all private ex they're all ex cops um they're all private licensed private investigators and and you know to get someone to review your you know you lost a son you lost a daughter to get a private investigator just just you know the opening review is thirty thousand dollars yeah so the nlij will will sponsor this for for free, we'll do the investigation if we think that, you know, we can be of help. So um, NLIJ.org, you, you'll, you'll, you'll find us there. And if you, anybody out there listening to this, they got a murdered family member, uh, police are not returning their calls, talk to NLIJ. That's fantastic. Yeah, That's we've, been, we've, really been kind of, um, we've been talking about why there isn't an organization. I know, I mean, we know Cheryl Mack McCollum, she does like, a, she has a cold case foundation that she does, but I think, I think there needs to be more, it needs to be more yeah. because there's so many, there's so many cold cases out there and like what you and Laura are doing. I mean, Laura's got, I mean, we have so many, we, we've put together teams before of retired FBI agents, forensic teams to go look for victims remains. I mean, there's, there's so much work to be done and, you know, and yeah. the, Regular law enforcement, they just, they don't have the bandwidth. They don't have, and they don't, they're kind of limited by what they can do because of law. And they're, you know, because they have to, they want to look at something and do something where they're going to be able to close a case. So their parameters are so much smaller, but, you know, right. some organizations like you're, the one you're involved with, it, they can go where the cops can't go. That's right. That's right. Uh, bandwidth, I think that's a good, that's a good way to describe it. Uh, because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the cops on the front line uh, want to do this. Yeah. Uh, but 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 they're, 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 the mountain of bureaucracy above them is 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 just, you know, they're in straitjackets. Yeah. Um, and, and, and that bureaucracy is untouchable. It's, you can't communicate with that bureaucracy. They have their own language. They're locked doors. Um, and and and, uh, you know. That bureaucracy is as locked to us as it is to the cold case detectives. 
And, yep. and it's frustrating right. for everybody to, to see that. A lot of victims don't realize that. It's not the cop, actually. It's the cop's bosses. Exactly. It's the bureaucracy. Right. It down. And it's the prosecutor's office. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. They're the ones yep. who pull the strings. You don't They're get the DA the... on board. You yeah. got to get the DA on That's yeah. what I learned. Yeah. I learned that very gradually. I mean, this was a we have to. Yeah. I'm sure Laura for you too, right? You know, oh, yeah. you begin mm -hmm. to learn like that. Like, yeah, you get all these cops on your side finally. 18 months, you finally get through to the cops, and then you realize that you know now you got another 18 months to get through to the district attorney because the cop right. can't even get the district attorney to return the call to them. <laughs> you know? Right. Yeah. yeah. All right, Peter, we're gonna stop right now, but don't hang up because we have to like upload it. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on today. Yeah, I think we're going to be talking to you again. Yeah. We got a lot of things that we can talk to you about because right. we have some other stuff. Please visit our website where you can subscribe to the podcast, find show notes, and check out extra content from all of our podcasts. All rights reserved. This has been a production of 722 Media Content.